Um, Sparma took her, she planned a little um, game that we would play, that you would play. So if everyone could sit next to at least one other person, um, there's some pieces of paper and pens around the room that, um, so if you have your own paper and pen, that's fine. So if you'd like to take part, you will need a piece of paper and a pen and someone sit next to you, okay? Right, so yeah, my name is Katarina and I will talk to you about curiosity um, and a few baby steps <coughs> that we have taken along the past to investigate how curiosity develops in infants. So what is curiosity? Uh, we can think of it um, in terms of drives, so a drive that affects our behaviour and how we live. And uh, we have several drives that we share with other non-human animals, such as drive for food, uh, for creation, and seeking shelter. But humans seem to be unique in that we have this fourth drive called curiosity. So the drive to explore the unknown world uh, for the sake of acquiring knowledge. Um, and what's particular about this drive is that um, it doesn't seem to be driven by any uh, immediate reward. So we see exploratory behavior also in animals. They sniff out the environment, they crawl into holes they haven't seen before. Um, but they seem to be doing this for a reason. So sniff out to get to find a mate or crawl into a hole to see if it could be a good shelter. Whereas humans seem to be exploring for no particular reason. As far as we know, we're the only ones who, for example, gaze at the night sky and wonder what the stars are. And then invest a lot of time and money in investigating what the stars are and what, how the space works. <laughs> no. Okay, I'll just ignore that. Uh, so, um, why do we care about curiosity? Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the saying, curiosity killed the cat. And historically, actually, cur uh, exploratory behavior and curiosity has been uh, associated with sort of negative outcomes and warnings against exploring. Um, for example, we know the story of Adam and Eve, um, the forbidden tree, um, the Icarus flying higher and higher, trying to find out what else is there to see until his wings melted and he crashed down, and uh, opening the Fedora's box and unleashing all the evil of the world just because he wanted to find out what's inside. Um, but there's also positive things that people associate with curiosity. Here's our, just an example of two quotes from famous people, like Eleanor Roosevelt saying that if a mother could give any gift to a newborn child, she should probably choose curiosity. And Albert Einstein saying that he has no special talents, he's only passionately curious. So what is positive about being curious? So I thought we'd do a little participation, so we'll play a little game. Uh, hopefully you all have a piece of paper and a pen, and what I'd like you to do is to think of a fact, um, so a question about something that you know, but you think the person sitting next to you is unlikely to know. So it should be sort of a, a general fact, something that could be found online, for example, um, but you think that it's unlikely that the other person knows, okay? So if you can write down one question, so it shouldn't be a personal fact, uh, just write down something, a difficult question for your partner. Go. <laughs> Most of you are done, so save the time. Um, I'll ask you to fold your paper and exchange it with the nearest person next to you. Okay, lovely. So now you should all have a question in front of you that hopefully you don't know the answer. And what I want you to do is think about how badly you want to know the answer. Okay? 
So if you write down a number on a scale from 1 to 10, about how curious you are about finding out the answer to, to your question. So 1 would be not bothered, not interested, and 10 would be I'm really curious and badly want to know the answer. Okay? So just write down the number and leave it at that for now. We'll come back to it later on. Okay? So hopefully you're all curious now. And um, this feeling of curiosity, um, how does it feel? Is it a good feeling? Is it like an itch you want to scratch? Does it make you want to ask and find the answer? Um, we probably all experience curiosity differently, but um, when we look at some brain imaging studies where they actually induce curiosity in a similar way as you have to each other just now, they have actually found that curiosity elicits activation in the same parts of the brain as yearning for chocolate or nicotine does. So it's the same reward circuitry that is active when you yearn for knowledge as it is when you're food. Um, so does that mean that getting knowledge is as satisfying as having sex? I'll let you be the judge of that. But um, what we do know is that um, if you are curious about something and you really want to find out, you are actually more likely to remember it when you do get the information. And not only that, you're also more likely to remember any other information that is presented in this state of curiosity, even if it's not relevant to your question. So basically making you remember my talk better by asking each other those questions. Um, so this curiosity is obviously uh, a positive thing and it helps us learning. So how come a lot of adults found it difficult to nurture this curiosity, this exploration drive, um, and they find it difficult to uh, find anything interesting? Um, so there's big individual differences in how curious and exploratory we are. And as you probably guessed from the title is, uh, we think this might come from babies, or even um, in the early childhood. <laughs> are babies curious? So we know that if you observe any small child, they look curious, right? So they explore their environment, they, they eat sand, they put th fingers where they shouldn't do because they seem to be so curious, right? Uh, but how do we really measure curiosity? Uh, there's so many individual ways it, how it could be expressed. But uh, there is one gesture that seems to come online sort of globally in infants around 12 months of age, and that is the gesture of pointing. And pointing is a very useful thing. So you can communicate a lot through pointing just by using your hand and eye contact. So I'll just try to demonstrate how easy this is. So I choose a member of the audience. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'll try to communicate something to you by just using my pointing and my eye contact, and we'll see if, if people get it, right? So. <laughs> right, so obviously, I'm inviting her to get out of here. <laughs> um, so another example would be um, infants do this, right? So if I choose another member, you, <laughs> I'm just familiar faces. <laughs> So I'll ask you to imagine that I am a baby, okay, and you are not knowledgeable adult, okay? And you just respond in whatever natural way, the first thing that comes to your mind, what you, would you do if I were a baby and do this, okay? Babies, the more the less fortunate ones, 
They get a bad teacher who, who mislabels everything, right? So these are objects the babies know what they're called. Um, but the adult they're playing with keeps calling them weird things, right? So if they play with a duck and she calls it, calls it a shoe, and play with a banana and she calls it a car. So they basically establish that she's not a good source of information. And um, so what we, so this is the setup, so they're at the desk playing with, uh, with these toys. And then we play another trick in that um, behind the experiment there is a curtain and there are um, two window openings and the um, new objects mag magically appear from these windows. So now the question is, um, the baby sees the object, the experiment doesn't, will the baby point to these objects, right? So our default assumption is that babies will want to know about things that they see and they're interested in. Um, but if they really point to obtain information, they should change their behavior if they think they can't get information, like in the case when they're interacting with the stupid lady, right? This is baby pointing. Um, and so this is our findings. You can see that the group of babies who played with a knowledgeable person pointed twice as much as the babies who played with the ignorant one. Um, so that suggests that indeed they do point in order to um, obtain information from more, more knowledgeable others. Um, but does it actually affect their learning? So we know in adults, your learning is boosted if you're curious. Does that hold in babies as well? So we did another study in which we gave infants pairs of objects, and we held them up and waited for them to express their interest in one or the other. And once they did so, we either taught them the function of the object they pointed to, or the other one, right? So if curiosity is what drives the pointing and drives the learning, then they should only learn about the object they were curious about, and not about the random one that you chose, right? Um, and let's see what happened. After the, the demonstrations, we gave the toys to the babies and we looked at how much they replicated the actions that we showed them. And what happened was that they learned a lot more of the functions that were shown on the objects that they pointed to initially than the ones that they didn't. Okay? So we can conclude that um, they do learn if you respond to these gestures that we interpret as expressions of interest or curiosity. So we could stop here and say that we, we found an expression of curiosity and we found that if we respond to it, uh, infants learn better. But what about individual differences? So even in our small sample, uh, we found massive differences in how much babies pointed spontaneously. So the same babies also took part in a sort of a free play session with just their parents and we recorded how much they pointed to different things in the room during 10 minutes um, of free play. And we found that amongst the 80 babies, some pointed 30 times in the space of 10 minutes, and others didn't point at all. So where did these differences come from? It could be, um, is it really that some babies are more curious than others? Or is it maybe a difference in expression of this, right? So it could be that some babies just don't, don't point as much, or they don't know the function of this. Um, so in order to really get to the question of, um, individual differences in curiosity, we have to find a more <coughs> sort of objective measure that isn't dependent on babies expressing it behaviorally. So we try to do that next in the next series of studies, where we try to get to curiosity in the brain. So I've already mentioned that um, being curious activates the same parts of the brain as craving chocolate, um, but how does that actually help learning? So there's also a piece of progress done in that aspect in that um, they've identified a particular rhythm in the brain called theta oscillations um, that basically seems to be involved <coughs> in transmitting knowledge, uh, information from cortex to uh, memory areas in the brain like such as hippocampus. And uh, importantly, this activation seems to be modulated by reward. So if you tell the adults, I'll give you 10 pounds if you remember this word, and I'll give you one pound if you remember this one, um, you will see more of this theta oscillations for the high reward um, uh, items, and they will actually remember them better. So the more motivation, the more theta, the more learning. So we thought we'll try to look at this in infants as a potentially more objective measure of curiosity, because like Isha mentioned before, it doesn't 
that measure in EEG maybe doesn't require much from that, right? They just sit and watch and do it. So what we did with the first study is um, we had babies exploring objects. Um, so they played with eight different objects for 40 seconds each. And there were objects of various complexities. Some were quite sort of interesting, had lots of different bits, and other were uh, quite basic. And um, while they were playing with the objects, we recorded their brain activation and looking for these theta oscillations. So the idea was that um, different objects would elicit different amount of curiosity or interest, and therefore we would record different amounts of theta activation if that is um, what theta reflects in infants. And if it actually helps learning, like it is in adults, then babies should be better at recognizing the objects they played with, which elicited a lot of theta activation than the ones that didn't. And that is indeed what we found. So, not sure how to but basically there's a relationship between um, the amount of theta we recorded during exploration of, of objects and whether or not the babies were able to recognize these objects at test. Okay. Um, so what we want to look at next is, in this case, we recorded the brain activation while they were already acquiring information, right? So they were exploring the object actively. Um, so we don't know what the, the relation between theta and the, we see that it affects learning, but we want to know whether it's actually a drive to learn, right? Whether it's a motivation to learn. In which case, we should be able to see it even before infants actually uh, obtain information. So we set up another experiment in which we again had two ladies. So each baby saw two different girls. One of them was a good teacher, so she showed a new object and said, look, that's a blicket. We use a lot of made-up words. Uh, and the other one uh, would be equally engaging and interactive, but would never actually give information. So she would just point and say, ooh. Um, in another condition, we had them. Uh, one was English, or the native language, and the other one was foreign. And what we were looking at is um, anticipation of information. So they learned that one is a good teacher, and the other one isn't. And what happened in each video is that there was a two second gap. So the girl appeared, smiled, looked at the toy, and then nothing happened for two seconds. And so the only difference um, in that period of time was the baby's expectation. So will they receive information at the end of the trial or not? And we wanted to see that if this theta actually reflects some sort of motivation to encode new things, then we should see a difference even before they actually um, hear the outcome. And we did find the difference. So um, this is plotted basically the, the power of these theta oscillations, so the amount of it. The, the more red means more activation. If you look at the uh, preparing the informative versus the non-informative teacher, you can see that there's a difference in how much of this activation they show in anticipation of actually receiving the information. Um, so this gives us sort of a tool that we can now use to actually explore where these individual differences in expressions of um, curiosity come from, um, how does it actually work in the brain, how can we um, elicit these states of curiosity and so on. But coming back to your game, so <laughs> I'll ask you to look at your question again and remember just how much you wanted the answer. Okay? So you're all very curious and now you can tell each other your answer.
the answer to the question was, then you're probably still not very well now. <laughs> um, but if you're really curious, then hopefully now you're very happy and packing in on knowledge, and hopefully you'll remember it really well. Um, but what I'd like to finish with is um, just sort of a bit of an open question, is what do you think could happen if I let you that? So you got a question, and we all now live in a world where answers are available immediately, right? So if I let you Google your questions instantly and you got an answer in a matter of seconds, do you think you would still remember it? Or now you probably still would, but would you keep that knowledge later on? Um, and we know that now information is all around. You know, we've got everyone's knowledge of all the living people and all the dead people at our fingertips, right? And what does that do to our curiosity? Do we, do we harness this knowledge and we're now free of you know, using our brain power to, to use it more creatively and um, explore other things? Or does this instant fix of you know, the questions that we have, this um, constant information feeding actually hinder our exploration? And we, we just acquire all these useless facts that we don't even bother to remember because we know where to find it again, right? And, um, and also importantly, now that this technology is more than ever available to, to children. What will that do to their curiosity? Um, will adults become redundant as sources of information or even inadequate, since we have Google, right? And, uh, <laughs> I think it's a really good uh, uh, example. As a colleague of mine told me about her daughter, who was four at the time. Uh, they were planning a Christmas holiday in Canada. And uh, her daughter asked her if there was going to be snow in Canada for Christmas, and the mum replied that she doesn't know. And the girl said, at the age of four, well, ask your phone. Just, just type in Canada Christmas snow, and it will tell you. And I think that's a, an amazing example of, you know, even very young children have this concept of the whole world of knowledge hidden behind our phones, right? And what will that do to how they seek information and, and Will it encourage their curiosity or hinder it? I think the challenge is that we, um, you know, we let them explore, but actually make sure that they, they don't just stay at the superficial level, but actually arm themselves with this knowledge and dive deeper and find more questions and be more curious about things. Um, and I think it's important, and if I haven't convinced you, there's been a recent study that showed that if you do stay active, throughout your whole life and acquire knowledge and learn um, even later in life, um, it seems that it actually could have a protective factor against dementia. So, um, I'm not sure you should agree. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I guess the message is that we should all stay curious and keep exploring and um, encourage our children to be curious and nurture their curiosity with the information and even more questions and we will live long. Thank you. Question to Katrina. <coughs> I'm interested in the study about the teacher who gave incorrect information yeah. and the teacher who gave the correct information. And I suppose it's more a comment than a question, but what would be interesting to see is if those children's curiosity was then dampened down more permanently. Because you might then sort of, if you have, because I was wondering about the, sort of the family background, the social background of the children you're testing, if you have a a child is brought up in a very stimulating environment, encouraged to do lots of questions. What kind of, how curious will they be? A child is brought up in a more, perhaps more sterile environment. And it'd yeah. be interesting to see if a child's constantly given the wrong information or, or false information, if that has a long term permanent effect on, on their ability to learn or, or their desire. Yeah. You know, they're constantly yeah. being just not getting the right stuff back. Yeah, absolutely. I've often wondered how funny it would be if you told a child the wrong noises for animals. <laughs> you know, you told them that sheep moo and yeah. you know, cows bar and how, how far they get before they realise that information was wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's that's a really good point. And um, I hope we didn't damage it in our experiments. <laughs> and it seems, it seems the children are very good at sort of assessing sources of information and just ignore you if you're bad and go into the good one. But uh, the point that you raised about um, general responsiveness they get in their home, I think, is crucial. Especially in, in behavioral expressions such as pointing, um, 
we think there must be a relation in, in how they must learn how to use this gesture, right? So it could be that one baby's pointing will always be responding with information, that's what they'll learn to use it for. Whereas if another baby's points are ignored, they'll stop pointing. Or if they're, they're responded to by giving them the toy, that that's what they'll learn the function is, right? So I absolutely think that these are very uh, you know, culture dependent, um, which is why we have that much variability probably, right? Um, and that is also why we try to get to the brain measures to see whether the expressions are actually uh, just hindered by, say, non-responsiveness, that they're equally curious but they don't express it, or is their curiosity actually dampened by it? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so a related um, thing, obviously, is surprise. Mm -hmm. Have you done anything <coughs> to, to try and look at um, what surprise looks like? No, but actually I did think, so there's a series of studies which you're probably familiar with um, where they look at exactly that, so how surprise affects um, learning and they, they have these um, objects that violate physical expectations, like they have a car that passes through a wall and then the children learn better about that car that violated their expectations than another object. Um, and I think my assumption would be that if we measure the EG during this, we would see a boosted theta. And, um, and they've also shown that um, they tend to then explore these objects differently. So if um, a, a, an object violates sort of the sort of physical, I don't know what it's called, the object. Um, solidity. Solidity, thank you. Then they tend to bang it afterwards to check, you know, how come did it pass through the wall? Assuming that's what I think. Or if, if an object just rolled off a, off a cliff and, and sort of stayed floating and didn't drop, then they tend to drop it more. So it, it seems to, this surprising features of the object seems to guide their exploration. So that's exactly that. So it induces this curiosity and interest and then they try to test it to, to find out what, what it is that makes them different. Well, you could have objects that violate their expectations, which um, is, I guess, tricky. But um, so one of the things we were thinking about exploring is uh, uh, this effect of another human being, right? So uh, we know that babies are very sensitive to um, to what adults think are interesting, and they pay attention to what you look at or what you point to, or if you use this infant like speech and exaggeration, then they, they tend to attend to it more and learn it better. So. Um, I think that's one of the ways where you could sort of guide infant's learning is to what is interesting. But on the other hand, it's, it also seems that this active learning, where they actually solicit the information themselves, is also beneficial. So, yeah, so I guess lots of factors. But. So, should Google slow down a bit so we have more time to <laughs> wait for the results and get curious and remember? Yeah, yeah, that would be. <coughs> um, hi. I was interested in outside. That's for practical reasons. Um, so do you plan to look at outdoor learning? Um, yeah, potentially. I mean, uh, we could definitely do behavioral studies outdoors. EG would be a bit hard, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question when, they're, uh, when it's a more, much more rich environment, obviously. We, because we want to make sure that it's sort of controlled for all the babies, we, you know, we put the same objects in the same place um, to to be able to compare between babies, but it's true that most of the learning happens in the real world where, it, where it's very variable and very um, stimulating. So it, yeah, it would be interesting to look at that as well. It was really just because when you said that um, children being bored or how to make them more curious, mm. it's often with children if you want them to be curious, take them outside mm. so, and there's more oxygen. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's not negligible, yeah, it's fresh air. Do you think babies ever kind of say, actually you're wrong, that's a banana? Um, or, or like how much do they just either passively absorb what you're saying during testing or kind of refute it? 
Um, I guess it's hard to say at this age because they're 16 months, so they're pre-verbal most of them, so they have a few words. But um, so there are societies with older ones where they do actually actively reject. Well, uh, point, lots of pointy studies have shown that they will try to correct if you misunderstand their communication. So, for example, if they, if they point. <laughs> She's alive. She's like, what the hell? <laughs> they will keep pointing. Or if you say, oh, that's the ceiling, you're like, no, no, I don't know what that is. Um, uh, but whether they just intake all the information doesn't seem so. I, I, I'm sure there's like a, like what she was saying, right? Whether if you teach them the wrong sounds, you know, if they already have a knowledge, you could probably override it if you're very persistent. But I mean, what's the point in that? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. They don't walk away thinking that it's a, a banana's a duck, for example. No, not after <laughs> as many demonstrations as we did, no. <laughs> and really just following up on what you were saying, Hank, we've got a lot of children, for example, who are speaking one language at home, and then they go to childcare, where they're learning another language, and their children age maybe two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. And so the la language that they've been pointing at home, that the banana and the duck, then they go to the, or in another language, and then they go to their child micro or their nursery, and when they point, they get another word, mm -hmm. which is a bit like, you know, saying something completely different mm -hmm. when they point. And so those bilingual children go into a slightly delayed phase in their language learning. Is that, is that the same sort of... Uh, so process? I think it's really interesting, the, the bilingual <coughs> thing. Uh, <coughs> the, the thesis study that I showed, we found, um, that they selectively sort of engaged with the native speaker and not the foreign one, right? So these were all monolingual English, English only hearing babies. But I do wonder what would happen if they were bilingual. So they, they do have this constant input of having two different languages, two different words for every single thing. Will they be more open to learn from any other language as well? So does it transfer to, to being more tolerant of you know, having more information for the same thing? Because there is this um, phenomenon that's called mutual exclusivity, where babies tend to reject the second label for, for an object that they already know the word for. And I'm not entirely sure, but there, there might be differences between monolingual and bilingual in how they treat this. Um, so, yeah. So, do you think it would put them off from being curious? No, if anything, I would think the opposite. Well, okay, that's good. Because we're saying to you on funding. Yeah, if anything, I, I reckon there would be, but well, wait, I thought it was that, tell me more, you know? That, that's my intuition, whether. Sure. Um, I'm just interested, because you mentioned that the babies who were working with already um, able to judge the sources for liability. Mm -hmm. How early in the baby's development does that come about, then? The ability to judge the sources for liability. Um, so, we have sort of various indications that they can. Uh, so we chose 16 month olds uh, for that reason, because there was the youngest ones that we, we knew that they, they can do this in, the, in another study, and also that they have enough, big enough vocabulary to be able to you know, establish reliability, right, based on the word. Um, but they do also, uh, there's another findings from another colleague at the lab where um, they show sort of selective following of gaze based on reliability, so it's, it's a simpler, um, the way they establish her reliability is there's a face on the screen, and then uh, she'll say, look, and then something appears here, <laughs> right? So uh, there's no language involved, and it's a very simple mapping, and they tend to do it six months, I think, was the youngest one. That, so they stopped following gaze of the one that wasn't predictive of where the, the interesting thing will appear. So they're pretty clever. Very young. Yeah. Okay, are there any more questions? I'd like to thank Katrina and each year again. And <laughs> the next lecture will be just a little after seven, and so there's a wine and soft drinks and crisp reception outside, so it's you for the next half hour or so.
Okay. 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 Okay.